Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Unku Hanim, your host for today's SMCV's virtual gynae help talk. Okay, I hope everyone is feeling great and doing good today. So we know that um, we are already allowed to travel anywhere already. So please remember to always follow SOP and always to maintain social distance wherever we go. Yeah. Okay, so before we start with today's virtual help talk, let me go through the agenda of today's talk and also a brief introduction to Sunway Medical Center of the City. Okay. So for today's talk, we will have two speakers. That is um, Dr. Noor Elena Nordin, our first speaker, who will speak about cervical cancer and how do we prevent it. Okay, and then we have our second speaker, Dr. Ashley Chung, who will speak about ovarian cancer. Dr. Ashley is our fertility specialist and also a consultant uh, obstetrician and gynecologist. Okay, before that, um, we would like to inform that we will pick three lucky winners to win our gynae screening package worth RM500 each. So this package includes a specialist consultation by either Dr. Noor Eliana or Dr. Ashley, pap smear test, pelvic or abnormal and ultrasound, and also abnormal examination. So the lucky winners will also win a special merchandise from us. So we will choose the winner at the end of each Dr. Talk session. So be sure to stay tuned, okay? Okay, now a bit information about Sunway Medical Center Velocity. Okay, so we are a new addition to Sunway Healthcare Group. We are located in a part of an integrated township, Sunway Velocity, which consists of retail, residences, college, and also mall. So we are located in Cheras, Kuala Lumpur, and we're just 3 km away to KL City Center. Okay. So this is how our Velocity Township looks like. We have a Velocity Residence. We have Sunway Medical Center Velocity, Sunway Velocity Hotel. We also have Sunway Velocity Shopping Mall. And we have two covered walkway to MRT stations, which is um, Cochrane MRT Station as well as Maluri MRT Station. Okay. A bit overview about our hospital. We have officially opened our door to public since 3rd September 2019. We are a 10-storey block building. We have over 240 hospital beds and we have over 45 specialist clinic here. We have our own cardiac catheterization lab here. We have over 20 dialysis bay. We have 10 bays of chemotherapy day ward. 10 bays of digestive health ward, um, which was um, used to perform uh, endoscopy and scope, scope um, procedure. We have 12 critical care beds and we also have six operating theatres inside um, internal. Okay, so a bit about our state of art facilities and medical equipment. We are using two. 56 slice CT scan, 3T magnetic uh, resonance imaging. We are also using digital X ray imaging here. We have ultrasound imaging, we have bone densitometry system, and we are also using digital mammography system to perform a mammogram procedure. Okay, um, a bit of our medical specialties. So, as a tertiary hospital, we also offered a, a variety range of um, specialties. Um, as an example, we have our own cardiologist here, we have our own ENT, we also have a team of obstetric and gynecologists, we also have our own MICU unit here, we have pediatric services, psychiatry, psychiatry services, and much more. Okay, now moving on to the last part of this presentation, I would like to share about our room and board uh, read. So our bed started from 90 ringgit for four bedded room, ranged to 1,288 ringgit for our premier suite. Okay, that's all uh, a bit information about uh, Sunday Medical Center Velocity. So without uh, wasting much time, let us welcome our first speaker, Dr. Noor Elena Nordrin. Dr. Noor Elena Nordin, apologies, our consultant obstetrician and gynecologist to share everything about cervical cancer. You guys can also um, ask questions and always drop the question in comment section. 
and we will answer uh, as much question as we can from this um, talk session today. Okay, let us welcome Dr. Nor Eliana Nordin. Hello, Dr. Eliana. Your mic is on mute. <laughs> Can I unmute your mic? <laughs> Hi, Dr. Hi, how are you? Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm here to give the uh, cervical cancer talk and about how to prevent it. Okay. Without further ado, let's start. So what is cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is disease um, in which uh, um, affects uh, the cervix. Yeah? Cervical cancer cervix, um, just to remind you a bit, this is the female reproductive organ. The cervix is here. Yeah. Okay, Malay people call it Panka Rahim. So this is the cervix. So cervical cancer is the cancer in here. Okay, so is uh, cervical cancer happens when the cervix cell uh, become uh, it grows out of control, and this is almost always as a consequence of long term HPV infection. HPV is human papilloma virus. Okay, so how does cervical cancer develop? It's very important to know how cervical cancer develop because cervical cancer doesn't just like pops up like that. Yeah, it takes years uh, for it um, to uh, become cancer. So what happens? Okay, as you see in the picture here, uh, again, this is the picture of a female reproductive organ. And here is the pankal rahim or cervix. Okay, this is the front view of the cervix. And uh, this is a normal cervix. You can see the cervix here is clear and smooth. And at the end here, you can see a disease or a cancerous cervix. Okay, although this is a cartoon picture, uh, it more or, uh, more or less depicts the real uh, situation. So, uh, cervical cancer from normal cervix to cancerous cervix doesn't just come like that. Okay, it takes years uh, with persistent HPV infection for the cell become abnormal first. So, this picture here shows normal cell. And uh, this picture uh, shows a precancerous cell. Okay, so uh, in years with a uh, long-term HPV infection, the cell changes. It becomes abnormal first. And if it's nothing done or the HPV infection doesn't clear up, eventually uh, the virus itself stays in the cell and kind of like alter the genetic of the cell and make the cell grow out of control. Then it becomes cervical cancer. Of course, um, if uh, one have if HPV infection, the um, cell can become to this side here a little bit abnormal. With uh, the clearance of HPV infection, usually uh, one can uh, the cell can revert back to normal. Okay, so uh, the message of this, how it develops, it, because of persistent HPV infection, um, the uh, virus kind of alter the DNA of the cell and the cell become abnormal and become uh, cancerous, okay? So um, the symptoms of um, cervical cancer usually doesn't appear until it becomes quite late. Uh, so to say, until the disease become quite severe, only one can have symptoms. So the usual symptoms with cervical cancer are unusual vaginal discharge. Uh, female usually will have some kind of discharge um, according to the menstrual cycle. But with a um, cervical cancer, you have some funny discharge, like a bleeding discharge, orange discharge, or foul smelling discharge. Okay, uh, cervical cancer can be presented as well uh, with abnormal vaginal bleeding. Uh, means to say uh, bleeding after sex, okay, or bleeding after the usual menses, okay? Or in severe cases when the um, uh, cancer is already bad, uh, heavy bleeding, okay? And last but not least, the usual presentation is pain during sexual intercourse. Also, if this happens, means the cancer is actually quite big. So, um, so uh, in summary, the symptom is not obvious until the disease is actually quite bad, okay? 
Okay, the good thing about cervical cancer, unlike other gynecological cancer, uh, we have a method of prevention. Okay, so I'm sure most of you know that there is pap smear, is readily available, it's free in KKM facilities. Uh, there is HPV vaccine, human papilloma virus vaccine, as well as a relatively newer um, HPV test. Okay, so I'll go through one by one. Okay, so perhaps a little bit of history here, uh, just for interest. Okay, this um, chap here, this uh, man here, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Papa Nicolou. That's where Pap smear gets his name from, okay? If you ever wonder what Pap is, it's actually from his name. So this guy actually um, contributed so much in uh, cervical cancer screening in that he proved that cervical cancer can be sort of uh, detected by looking at cells. So what he's doing here is actually looking at the cervical cell. Uh, so be, uh, before um, it becomes cancer, it looks at the abnormality of the cell. And with the pap smear screening, um, a successful uh, uh, cervical screening program, um, the screening managed to reduce uh, uh, incidence of uh, cervical cancer uh, very significantly. Okay, so in the developed nation, uh, cervical cancer is no longer um, uh, the topmost uh, cancer for female. Okay. So what is pap smear test? So a pap smear test is basically looking at the abnormal cell of the cervix. Uh, usually what it means is precancerous. Before the cancer happens, the cell becomes abnormal. So this is what the pap smear is looking at. So if one have had pap smear done before, what will happen during pap smear test is a, a speculum, uh, this thing. Um, Lay people usually call it uh, mulut ite. Here yeah, it looks like the, like, like, uh, uh, it take uh, big lah, uh, yeah, dark big, yeah. Okay, so put it inside the vagina, opens it up, so the healthcare worker can uh, visualize the cervix and collect the sample from the cervix itself, uh, either using a brush or a spatula. And traditionally, uh, uh, the collected cell is being smeared on this slide, and from there on, this slide is being examined. Uh, under uh, the microscope, just like how uh, Papa Nicolou did it last time. Okay, so um, for pap smear, uh, it must be done by uh, healthcare workers, be it a nurse, um, a doctor, or any trained uh, personnel. And it, hence, it has to be done in the healthcare facilities. And by a Malaysian guideline, uh, if you had a normal pap smear, two consecutive yearly pap smear, Pap smear can be done every three years. Okay. Okay. Although pap smear is readily available, in fact, it's free. Uh, unfortunately, only two out of five women undergo pap smear. Yeah. This survey is done by IPPK and shows in Malaysia, out of five female, only two had it done. Okay. Meaning, um, yeah, out of five, only well, out of ten, four, four goes for pap smear. And to those who have it done uh, previously, less than half actually go for regular pap smear screening. Uh, so this is not like a one-off thing, but you have to go for screening regularly. Okay, so that's the, 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 the barrier that we have to overcome in order to bring down cervical cancer case. Okay. So now move on to the second prevention method is uh, about um, uh, vaccination, HPV vaccination. So before that, I'll just try, I mean, uh, I'll explain about HPV DNA. So again, a little bit of history. Uh, this guy here, okay, if uh, Papa Nicolo is from Greece, this time round is a virologist from German, okay? One day, I hope we can have like a Malaysian person who, uh, a Malaysian who can can uh, discover something new. Okay, so this guy here is a virologist from German. What he discovered is a breakthrough. He found the association of cervical cancer with this virus, um, HPV. Okay, so what he uh, proved is that persistent infection of HPV leads to cervical cancer. If you know a uh, smoking cause 
lung cancer, the association of HPV infection and cervical cancer is stronger than the association between smoking to lung cancer. So that, that is how significant is persistent HPV infection uh, with cervical cancer. Okay, so uh, this has been a little bit of the picture here. So what it shows here, again, just like the previous picture, uh, this is the HPV uh, infected the cell. Persistent infection means it sits in the cell, in the cervix. Over time, years, it alters the genetic uh, of the cell, uh, which means the cell becomes, you know, like, rosa like that. And then it, uh, and then it overgrown, so become cancer. So this guy here, thanks to him, he found this out. And in fact, he won a Nobel Prize because of this discovery, okay? So, because of this finding, people developed HPV vaccine. And uh, to those who don't know, HPV vaccination is actually being incorporated in our uh, national immunization system. So, female uh, secondary school uh, will get this HPV vaccination um during form two okay i've been told some schools still continue but however due to uh this covid pandemic yeah uh, i mean they doing don't do it not now for a while eh? although some schools still continue it so uh, most foundation comes in three doses to those uh, in the, the more developed countries they start giving hpv vaccination even um uh, to children from nine to twelve years old because what they found, the younger that they uh, give this vaccination, the more protection the vaccination will give. Okay, so for, for us in Malaysia, we start giving at 14 years old, 15 years old, secondary school. So it comes uh, for those uh, who has the vaccination after 14 years old, 15 years old, it comes in three doses. Okay, the first dose, and then the second dose is two months after the first dose, and the third dose is six months after the first dose, or four months after the second dose. Okay, so this is a, um, a graph showing the efficacy of uh, HPV uh, vaccination. Okay, it can help uh, against uh, cervical cancer as well as other cancer and rectal cancer, uh, for instance, anal cancer. Okay, and a significant reduction in cervical cancer. So let's look at this graph. This is a, uh, the, okay, this is uh, in the y axis is the incidence of cervical cancer and the x-axis shows the age, okay? So green, for instance, okay, these are the um, uh, female who are being vaccinated uh, less than 17 years of age. So if you look here, the incidence of uh, um, cervical cancer is very low when they get vaccinated at a very young age. And this study actually follow up this female for more than 10 years, okay? The blue line to those vaccinated uh, from the age 17 to 30 um, uh, fairly reduced risk of getting cervical cancer compared to those who are unvaccinated. Okay, so this is what the graph shows. So HPV vaccination do uh, does uh, decrease the incidence of cervical cancer. Okay, so now um, moving on to the third prevention method is HPV test, okay? So understanding the disease, again, um, um, cervical cancer almost always um, being caused by a, a HPV, hence without HPV, um, unlikely to get cervical cancer. So instead of having a regular pap smear, there are kind of like newer tests being developed now, um, maybe starting in 2010, 10 years, not new, but yeah, 10 years, um, test the presence of HPV. So instead of uh, testing the abnormal cell, test the virus itself, the presence of the virus itself. And in fact, many guidelines now recommend the uh, primary HPV testing instead of pap smear. And the good thing about HPV test is a self-test is available, which means you can do it yourself at home, no need to come to the hospital, uh, I mean, overcome the barrier of embarrassment and things like that. And if it's negative, it can be done every five years instead of three years with cervical, I mean, uh, instead of every three years with a pap smear. Okay, this graph here shows the, uh, detection rate between pap smear alone, 
HPV DNA test, as well as the co-test, meaning pap smear combined with HPV DNA test. So if you uh, do pap smear alone, the uh, sensitivity is about 50%. We do miss case, yeah. Uh, HPV DNA alone, uh, 95% sensitivity. If co-testing, which means do both tests, almost always we won't miss any abnormal or precancerous cervical lesion. So it's a good test, okay? Okay, this is um, um, uh, an example of a HPV self uh, test kit. Uh, if you show my, if you, any one of you had a look at my video, um, this is what I call the gadget. Okay, it's called the Evelyn brush, but of course there are other brands, but I think this uh, brand is particularly, uh, is more um, readily available in the market now. It's a, a self test uh, sampling. Uh, that can be done at home. You do it yourself. Um, you don't have to be embarrassed because you do it yourself at home. And the quality of the sampling is actually comparable uh, with a, um, the test being done by doctors. And you don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to go to the hospital. And it doesn't need the use of speculum to do it. Okay. So this is a, the Evelyn brush. Yeah. In fact, I have a sample here. Just okay, so this is my gadget here. Okay, this is the Evelyn brush. Okay, looks long, but doesn't mean that you have to put everything inside your vagina. And I've got my little model here. Oops, there you go. So how it, uh, how it, I mean how to use it is just technically remove the cat here. Okay, and you push out for a brush. Okay, brush. All right, so what you do is just insert this brush here into the vagina. Once it's in, so the stopper here, so not the whole thing goes into your vagina, just halfway here, and then push it. Once it's in, okay, you just twist it. And in fact, it's very good that you have a click. Can you hear the click? Okay, so you click, click, click five times. So that to make sure you actually uh, sample your cervix properly. Lah. Click, click, click. So you won't get it wrong. After you had five click, pull it back. Okay, this is the funny part. Yeah. Okay. Pull it back. There you go. Cap it. And that you're done. Okay. No need to feel embarrassed. No need to go. If you're so takut to go, this is the way to go. Okay. So now back. Okay, thank you, Evan. <clears throat> okay, so that's the Evelyn brush. Okay, so in fact, I know female all like shopping. Go to Shopee, go to Lazada. But why, why not to go online and have a look if you haven't had your pap smear done? Okay, uh, I'm sure if I ask when you had your pap smear, you'll be thinking, like, mm, when my last pap smear is, or maybe, oh, I never go to pap smear. Okay, you can check out this website, Evelyn uh, HPV Self Test. In fact, you can just order the key online, be sent to your home, read instruction properly. In fact, in their website, they have video to show you how to do it. And they will send it to you, you do it, and you will send back and you will get your result. If it needs a further um, um, attention, you can see the doctor for that, okay? Um, so I think uh, the whole point of this is there are tests available and, um, um, and a woman should take opportunity to, to use it, okay? So conclusion, again, cervical cancer is preventable, okay? Uh, the point of it, get vaccinated and have regular uh, cervical screening, be it pap smear or if you're too embarrassed to go, uh, a lot of commitment, you can in fact buy it online. Okay, that's all from me. Okay, thanks. Back to you, Hanim. Hi, Dr. Elena. Thank you for the very um, informative talk. I have one comment here. One of the participants said, there's first time seeing that thing. Thank you for the info, Dr. Elena. <laughs> okay, doctor, I'll just read um, about um, certain questions that I've received um, earlier. 
So um, everyone who's watching this uh, virtual talk can also drop uh, always drop your question in the comment section and we will ask question uh, live to Dr. Nana. So I will ask the question that we have received earlier. Okay, doctor, so will the treatment of cervical cancer in case the person is already have it affect the chance of getting pregnant? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so treatment of cervical cancer is depending on the stage of it, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, uh, if at the very late stage, stage four, um, you are no longer talking about surgery, is chemo and radiotherapy. If that's the case, then of course it affects um, the pregnancy. Earlier stage as well, usually treatment for cervical cancer is basically uh, removing the whole uh, reproductive system. Okay, even for stage one, meaning the cervix and the whole. If that's the case, then of course one cannot get pregnant. In early days, there's an option of just uh, dealing with the cervix only, which means it's here. So technically, one can still get pregnant, but not without risk. Usually, there's problem with the survive the cervix not being completed because we, we chop off the part of the cervix. So it's no longer um, the same as before. Uh, so there's a problem with uh, keeping the pregnancy inside. So all in all, uh, yes, it does affect uh, 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 pregnancy. Yeah, or in fact, cannot get pregnant, lah, depending on the stage. We hope that answers the question. Okay. Now we read the question from the audience. Ms. Achik asks, if we have done the HPV self-test and got a positive result, what should we do next? Okay, thanks for the question. So for the HPV self-test, let's say you already committed to um, purchase the uh, self-test kit, um, particularly that brand, uh, the result will come back to you. So for the next step, yes, you have to see a doctor for that because you will need explanation and to discuss um, with a doctor as to uh, what should be done next. Usually, this will involve a co-testing, cool which means a pap smear test. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, doctor. Another question from Miss Wong. Is age 40 plus too late to get the HPV vaccine, doctor? Okay, as I say in my talk, uh, the earlier, the better, but I think the cutoff mm -hmm. for, uh, for the HPV vaccination is uh, 45 years old. So 40, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, late, but not too late. Yeah, yeah, still can get it. Okay. Um, another one question from Miss Cindy. Let me show to the screen. She is asking, is it better to do pap test yearly instead of once in every three years to prevent cervical cancer? Okay, thank you, Cindy. Uh, okay, that's a question. Most people would want to do yearly. Mm. But when we talk about a national screening, it's about, uh, it's about the cost effectiveness. Okay, I always say to my patient, of course, you can do like health screening, for instance, monthly if you want. Yeah, but usually uh, health checkup you do yearly or two yearly, isn't it? Because you want to know what you want to achieve from it. So from national guideline, cost effectiveness, as much as we want to test, we don't want to over test as well. Sometimes over testing can do more harm than good. It means that over intervention. So I wouldn't say it's wrong to do it uh, yearly. But in terms of cost effectiveness, uh, three yearly is sufficient. Um, I hope three that years. Uh, I mean, like every three years once. Okay, uh, is it um, related um, to the age? Meaning, like below forty, you should get um, below forty years old, you should get three years once, or it applies to every age group. Okay. So, if you want to be more specific, so the Malaysian uh, cervical screening. I uh, recommend uh, uh, cervical cancer screening from the age of 21 until mm. the age of 65. Okay, with the advent of HPV test as a primary test, actually for a female age, 20, uh, age 21 until 35, the first recommendation is three yearly pap smear screening. Uh, okay, yeah. so between uh, between sorry between thirty to forty nine is a, a co testing HPV test with pap smear. Okay, 
Uh, so if you want to know, uh, so if HPV is negative, is uh, every five years. Mm. Uh, the question. Mm. Okay, doctor. I think I will ask um, another two questions. Okay, this is from also Miss Achi. Why the HPV vaccine is recommended up to forty-five years old only? Yes, that's a very good question. So first of all, HPV is a very common infection. Uh, HPV has got a lot of strains, like 100 plus strain, uh, meaning to say HPV is a group of virus, but it's got a different strain. Yeah, That's why they have got a high risk HPV and low risk HPV. So why it recommended to just have it up to the age of 45? Because by the age of 45, because it's a common infection, most of the time, people probably will have acquired the infection already. So the whole point about vaccination is producing antibody against the infection. So just like COVID, right? Okay, now we are so familiar with COVID. So before we get COVID, we we, we get vaccination, sort of like that. Or chicken pox, for instance. Before we get chicken pox, we get vaccination. So HPV, by the time we are 45, most people probably in their life probably would have get HPV infection already mm -hmm. and because they are fit, they don't even know that they had it because the body clears the HPV. HPV. So those uh, who had uh, persistent infection, those are that, uh, for instance, immunocompromise. Uh, for example, uh, people have got chronic disease, they are on uh, immune drug, so their immune system is being suppressed, you know, people that get organ transplant. So these are people who cannot clear the HPV infection. So the HPV infection sits in and then can cause cancer. So to, to the answer, uh, to answer the question, I uh, recommend at the, at the age of 45, because if you above 45, most of the time you already got the HPV already and your body probably have antibody to it. So no point uh -huh. messing about that. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, doctor. Um, okay, one more question from Miss Noor Mary Shah. Is pap smear test only advisable for married and um, sexually active person? So technically, um, this pap smear test involves um, inserting the uh, speculum to inside the vagina. So technically, those who are not married or not sexually active, usually we don't do pap smear. Lah. Mm. Okay, doctor, I think um, to end um, your talk session, um, I think because I saw this in comment section, probably you can just um, give your advice or, or things that uh, this person should do lah, since she said he or she already has the virus. Um, I mean, like, uh, most of people probably would have had HPV virus. If you had, like, things like Veruca, you know, like, that Ketuat thing, those are all actually uh, actually HPV. But as long as you're a fit person, your body is able to clear it out. So, I, I, I don't know, like, um, how fit you are, uh, Skittles. So, uh, if you're a fit person, most of the time, your body will clear out the virus. Comes and goes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Elena, for the very, very informative talk. So um, everyone who always, uh, have question can always uh, drop the question in the comment section. For now, we will move to our second speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Elena. That's, that's the time we have for now. Okay. Okay. Now, let us uh, move wait a bit for our second speaker to be prepared for this session. Thank you everyone who keep um, watching us. Okay, don't, oh, okay. Uh, a moment, yeah. If we can have, sorry, um, Dr. Nor Eliana back to give, uh, to, to do one lucky draw segment. Okay, Dr. Eliana. Okay. I'm so sorry, Dr. Okay. Hi, Hande. Okay. I forgot to Hi. leave you. <laughs> so sorry to cut you there. So sorry to cut you there. That's the minute we'll talk today. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, everyone, we have a lucky draw section. 
So Dr. Elena will choose one winner from uh, from the registered participants today. Okay, come on, Dr. Elena. We all jangan kecil hati ah. I don't choose one. I just press only. Later the computer will start. <laughs> okay. Okay. Press the screen. No sound, honey. Ting 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 ting. <laughs> I think at the end got Okay, can you show the screen? Maybe you read the name first because we can't read yes, the name. Yes, Nursia Binti Yuhani. So congratulations, Miss Nursia. I think I saw you in the comment section. So we will drop an email on how to redeem uh, the voucher as well as the special merchandise from us. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lena. So sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Lena. Congratulations to our winner, Miss Norcia. Okay, so remember to stay tuned um, and watch our virtual talk until the end of this session because we have yet to choose another two lucky winners. So let me repeat um, the, uh, the gift for these uh, lucky winners is a gynae screening package worth 500 ringgit. So this package includes a specialist consultation by either Dr. Elnor Eliana or Dr. Ashley, our second speaker for today. Pap smear test, pelvic or abnormal ultrasound and abnormal examination. So we will also give um, a special merchandise to these lucky winners. So stay tuned until the end of this talk show. Okay, let us welcome our second speaker today. That Dr. Ashley Chung. Dr. Ashley Chung is our fertility specialist, consultant obstetrician and gynecologist that will share about um, ovarian cancer and everything you need to know about ovarian cancer. Okay, let us welcome Dr. Ashley. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dr. Ashley. Hi. Hi. Hello to everyone. Thanks for staying with us on this lovely Saturday afternoon. All right, today I'm going to show something, I'm uh, going to share something about ovarian cancer. So what happens if my tummy makes me look pregnant when I'm not pregnant? So uh, let's go through our reproductive system, uh, female reproductive system before we go uh, forward. All right, so here is the vagina canal. All right, this is the cervix, all right, the womb. So when someone got pregnant, the baby will grow inside the womb cavity. And this is the fallopian tubes. We have left and right fallopian tubes. And we have two ovaries. They are left and right ovaries. So today we will focus on the ovaries. So, well, what are ovaries? They are actually a pair of very small organs that are located at the lower part of the tummy and it's actually connected to the womb as I showed just now and it stores the women's uh, uh, egg supply. So what is ovarian cancer? Yeah, it sounds very disaster. Yeah, cancer is actually a disease of cells in the body. So normally how the cell grows is they only multiply in an orderly way when the new cells actually make only when they are needed. So when someone has, a, has cancer, it means that this process actually goes wrong and the cancer cells actually grow or multiply too quickly than we need it. So as they multiply and grow, so this cancer cell actually will damage all the healthy tissues around. So in ovarian cancer, the cancer cells actually comes from the ovary. So this is called the primary ovarian cancer. So if, for instance, if these cells are taught to come from uh, the nearby uh, organs like the fallopian tubes, uh, they are close by or uh, it can actually spread beyond the ovary to the womb, to the tummy, uh, to the intestine, to the bowels, to the lungs, and so on. So there are main three types of ovarian cancer that uh, I will go through today. So one of it is the epithelial ovarian cancer. That means that it's the tumor actually starts on the outside of the ovary, on the surface of the ovary, and the majority of the cancer-causing ovarian tumor are this type of cancer. And we have another type, we call it as the stromal cancer. Uh, actually, it starts from the ovarian cells uh, that makes hormones. So doctors can uh, typically actually diagnose this cancer earlier and it made up about 1% of the ovarian cancer. 
So the third type is the germ cell cancer, where it actually starts from the uh, egg cells. So these tumors are very rare, so it makes make up less than 2% of brain cancer, and they, uh, they actually happen in younger women or in girls. So how common is ovarian cancer? If we say in UK, the ovarian cancer is actually the fifth most common cancer and over 6,000 uh, women were diagnosed each year. So they make up about 4% of uh, newly diagnosed cancer every year. So majority of the cases actually occurs uh, after the women have gone through uh, menopause or usually they age about 50, uh, but younger women do have the possibility of getting it too. So how about in Malaysia? So if in Malaysia we see that uh, ovarian cancer is one of the most common cancer in Malaysia. Uh, ovarian cancer is one of the top 10 uh, cancer in Malaysia. So if according to the uh, National Registry of Malaysia uh, from 2012 to 2016, ovarian cancer actually stands up to about 3% of newly diagnosed cancer in Malaysia yearly. So Remember, it's 3.1% is actually quite a significant number. So um, if we look into the ovarian cancer, we do have different stages of ovarian cancer. So can, from, the, from the registry reports, actually do mention that um, the, the incidence, the prevalence of ovarian cancer is around 50 years old to 69 years old. Uh, and uh, it actually come up to about 18.5% for those population who's aged 65 to 69. Do bear in mind that the younger women, like around 35 to 44, they do have the chance of getting it around 4 to 7%. And we can see here, stage 4 ovarian cancer do have stand about 26% of them might have diagnosed stage 4 ovarian cancer uh, from 2012 to 2016, right? So uh, mainly what are the causes that actually cause ovarian cancer? Um, mainly uh, it's unknown, but however, there are a few risk factors that we would like to bear in mind that might actually have higher risk of ovarian cancer. For example, those who are age 50 and above, eight out of 10 cases occur in postmenopausal lady. And those who are overweight or obese, they increase risk of getting ovarian cancer. And those who has uh, reduced ovulation uh, during uh, their lifetime actually has a lower risk of getting ovarian cancer. What does it mean? Means that if um, if the ladies are uh, is taking uh, oral contraceptive pills or if they are pregnant or they are breastfeeding, that means they have less ovulation in their lifetime. Hence, they have lower chance of getting ovarian cancer. And uh, the risk of uh, getting ovarian cancer is slightly higher if they have not having, they have no children or they have, they, they, they had their menopause a bit later. So um, last but not least, if your family history of ovarian or breast cancer, definitely you have higher risk of getting it. So those who have actually faulty genes like BRCA1 or 2, you have actually 1 in 10 uh, chances of getting ovarian cancer. So what do I look, uh, what, what symptoms should I look for if I suspect myself to have ovarian cancer or tumors? So if you have abnormal tummy pain or pain down below here, so you want to take a look at it uh, by consulting your doctor. If you have painful sex, it's also one of the symptoms. If you have uh, pain uh, during your bowel opening, like for example, when you go for poop, then you feel that the pain is so unbearable and it's so unusual. So if you also have um, the urgency to urine most of the time and you go to toilet very frequent, probably you want to know that is there something wrong somewhere. And if you have a change in appetite, if you have reduced in appetite, or if you feel full quickly, when you, uh, or we call it as early satiety, that is also one of the symptoms of uh, ovarian uh, cancer or ovarian tumor. Okay, if you have a swollen tummy, definitely is one of the big signs to look into it, or you always feel bloated. So, 
how the doctor will diagnose you whether do you have an ovarian tumor or ovarian cancer normally a doctor will do an ultrasound on you a bedside ultrasound can see on the pelvic region can see roughly is there any enlargement in your ovaries is there any abnormalities on your womb and then uh, we will also add on a test a blood test we call it a ca125 this is one of the proteins that in your blood that we can uh, tell us roughly gives, gives us a direction and an idea what is going on if we see a tumor in your ovary. So probably you might be offered a CT scan as well to look into uh, your, your tummy area, like for example, your womb and your ovary in a more detailed manner. And sometimes you might be also advised to have a biopsy done. That means we take a small sample of the tissue for an examination and uh, most likely this procedure will be done in the x-ray department uh, just to make sure that you have given a, a general anesthesia so that you don't feel painful upon this uh, biopsy examination. Or if your tummy is swollen with fluids or we call it as ascites, then you might be advised to drain it and we might send the fluids for a check for, a cancer, for cancer cells. So if if unfortunately the cancer is confirmed, so definitely you will be referred to the uh, special, more specialized doctor, which we call it as a gynae oncologist doctor or any cancer center to actually uh, to do a surgery or to have a plan of treatment for you. So uh, treatment, I will roughly go through the treatment for you. Uh, first, uh, firstly, we will actually do a surgery. Most of the doctor will suggest surgery as a one of the primary treatment. So the type of the surgery will definitely depends on the stage of the cancer and also the grade and um, and also on uh, patient's wishes. So surgery normally involve uh, either in uh, removing the ovaries or the tubes, we call it a uh, sulfingo-ophrectomy, or we remove the womb and the cervix, that means we remove the whole reproductive system, and also we might also remove some layer of fat tissue in the tummy, we call it omentum. So sometimes biopsy of the limb nodes might um, be taken also uh, on your tummy area so that you want to see what stage of uh, cancer uh, is the patient having. So this actually helps us to give a very uh, detailed and uh, accurate idea of what is the stage of the cancer during the surgery. So what will happen after the surgery? Okay, will or will the pa will or will not the patient get a chemotherapy? It does depends on the stage of the disease. So chemotherapy actually is a drug that kills a uh, cancer cell and at the same time it does kill the healthy cells as well. So but ovarian cancer most of it they are very sensitive to chemotherapy. So after surgery, normally after surgery if uh, your disease need chemotherapy then the doctor will give a few cycle of chemotherapy but sometimes uh, chemotherapy may be given before the surgery we call it as new adjuvant therapy therapy to actually to string the tumor before we go for surgery then it will be easier for us to remove the tumor bef uh, after the chemotherapy so actually there are, there are numbers of different different uh, chemotherapy and anti-cancer drugs so you might be subjected to single drug or combination of the drugs but this depends on the type of cancer uh, brain cancer and also the stage so uh, that depends on the doctor who see you so uh, after the assessment so the common side effect will be just decreased appetite bleeding bruising sometimes you have diarrhea some uh, infection and of course facility issue as well so uh, I'm going to finish my talk soon. So what are we going to take home uh, from this talk is we have to bear in mind that ovarian cancer, yes, it's not very, very common, but ovarian cancer is in top 10 of uh, our uh, cancer cases in Malaysia. So it stands up to 3.1% of newly diagnosed cancer every year. It does affect a younger group of patients as well. Um, 
and also uh, mainly it affects postmenopausal lady. After 50 years old, if you think that you are already menopause, you don't have any issues anymore, you don't have any abnormal bleeding, but you have tummy swelling, this is an alarming sign that you should actually visit your uh, gynecologist in time. So bear in mind, ovarian cancer, it might not be, uh, it, you might not feel anything, but you just, uh, just have a swollen tummy, a bigger tummy that you might think is fat or you might think is gas, but actually it could be an ovarian tumor. So keep in mind symptoms of tummy pain. When, if you feel uh, full quickly, you will feel early satiety or you feel that your tummy has uh, always feel bloated. If you have frequent urination, if you go to the toilet very, very frequently or if you have some pain uh, during sex, these are the symptoms to look for. So uh, last but not least, this could be just normal symptoms that you might think that, oh, aging, so hence I have this kind of symptom. So no worries, I'll be fine. But do have a check with your gynecologist if you have any doubts. So um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, end my talk and I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Dr. Ashley, for the very informative talk. Okay, now let us welcome for a Q&A session. And no one can always drop your questions. Then we can ask Dr. Ashley. You can straight away get your answer. Okay, before that, let me ask a few questions that um, we have earlier from the participants. Okay, doctor. So this person is asking, if I have ovarian cancer, do my family members also need to do genetic testing? Because as mentioned earlier, I remember you said um, it's it's also genetic cost, cost for cancer, right? So can you elaborate further on this? Yeah, if let's say um, your uh, ovarian cancer is related to what we call it BRCA1 or 2. So if your doctors do uh, notice that you have this condition, then normally doctor will actually advise you to have a genetic screen for your, uh, for your, among your family members. Mm -hmm. So if your doctor do mention about it, then you should go to go for it. So if it's not, then probably it's not related. Mm. Mm. Okay. Doctor, you mentioned earlier one of the symptoms is bloated. So um, if it's tummy bloated, must it always come with other symptoms as well? So because one of my friends, she always complain that she has bloated even before or after meal. So All if right. it's bloated, how, how do we know it, it, is, it is ovarian cancer or how? Can you elaborate further on that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, bloatedness is actually a very common symptom to see. If I have gastritis, then I have bloatedness. If I my early pregnancy, I have bloatedness as well because of hormonal changes. So if I have constipation, I do have bloatedness as well. So of mm -hmm. course, it's not just single. Um, it's not just single symptoms that actually made up to say that oh, I have bloatedness equivalent to I have ovarian cancer. This. Uh, this is not, not, not really true. So if let's say, uh, for example, if you uh, feel that you have bloatedness that is uh, unexplained and is persistent mm. and you feel that it does actually relate to your tummy swollen and then you do feel some some hardness here and there, probably a bit, uh, you're a bit worried, then you can have a check. But if let's say bloatedness is just for a few hours, then that is not too relevant. So if persistent and if you feel worried and if it actually comes with other symptoms like, you know, solid tummy and then you loss of weight, loss of appetite, then mm. it's a sign as well. Okay, for this kind of person, right, doctor, what is the step that she should take if she has these um, bloated symptoms? What's the next step? Should, should she um, straight away see gynecologist or she should seek um, a GP um, a medical practitioner outside there for um, advice first? Okay, well, if uh, it does depend on the severity of the bloatedness, all right, like for example, the bloatedness, like I mentioned earlier, it started about like few days or one or two days because you want to actually rule out any, whether is there any gut issue as well, whether your uh, mm -hmm. 
gastric have any gastric issue as well so uh if let's say it is still early if you think that it's only like mild it's not too severe you don't feel like severe pain and things like that probably you want to have a gp to take a look whether is that like normal symptoms like gastritis right mm -hmm. so if you have rule out everything and the symptoms still persist so probably you want to have a check whether is that anything else that is going wrong so mm -hmm. then you probably can go to a uh, either gynecologist or if you think that it's still related to the uh, gut probably a gastrologist also might actually help at the same time okay Doctor, um, okay, so for other question that we have, so does any treatment for ovarian cancer can cause early menopause, doctor? Is that true? Right. Um, okay, it does, okay, uh, if let's say you go for, you have ovarian tumor and you go for treatment and the treatment is surgery, if let's say we remove uh, both the ovaries and we know that you we call it a surgical menopause that means you are mm. you actually been through menopause already it's just whether the symptoms appear uh, later on so if let's say we remove uh, only one ovary that for example the disease ovary on one side and the doctor decided to remove only just ovary then one ovary then you still have another ovary to actually support and produce the female hormone and you are not in the menopause state yet Mm. Okay, doctor, maybe one more question. If any audience have any questions, you can always drop in the comment section, yeah? Okay, maybe one more question that we have earlier. So, what about um, the relationship between, like, if the patient has ovarian cancer and the chance of that patient um, getting pregnant, does it, like, um, disturb or catch out it in any way? Okay. Um, chance? Okay, if let's say you are pregnant and they found out that you have ovarian tumor, that means you have swelling in your ovary, what do they do actually? So it does depends on how big is the uh, so-called cyst or uh, tumor in your ovary. And also it depends on how advanced is your gestation. So if you are in your early stage of pregnancy, like before, like, 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 uh, before your tummy, before uh, second trimester, before 14 weeks. So if your uh, ovaries uh, tumor is big and is suspicious, probably we will go for a surgery to remove the tumor. Mm -hmm. All right. So, or we might at the same time remove the, the, the ovary that is affected. So if let's say uh if let's say the 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 tumor that we removed the results came back to be uh something not we expected like for example cancer mm -hmm. so if it's ovarian cancer so what should you do and you are still pregnant so how uh and you are not at a stage of delivering yet so if your condition require chemotherapy so uh, when you are at your second trimester, uh, actually the doctor will avoid, will have a meeting between the, uh, the, the uh, oncology doctor and also the obstetrician and we will discuss your uh, condition. If you need a chemotherapy to be done, it is safe to be done actually on the second trimester. So it does depend on the type of the cancer and it does depend on the stage of the uh, disease. So if chemotherapy is needed, in pregnancy and it can be done. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ashley. I think that's all the time that we have for a Q&A session right. and for your talk today. Okay, before um, we let you go, let us um, continue to our lucky draw segment. So you need to help us to draw two names for the registered participants to win the lucky draw um, item. All right, so can you, yeah, can you? Yeah, so I'm gonna do the first one. Me, yeah. All right, okay, three, two, one. Right. <laughs> okay, all right, we, we take time a bit. Okay, second winners go to. Can you read the name for us first? No, maybe late. <laughs> No Ming Ling. Okay, congratulations, Miss Lu. We will share. Uh, we will send an email to you later. Okay, and uh, 
uh, last name for today's lucky right. winner. The last yes. winner of the day. Right. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> to our own music. <laughs> okay, maybe you read the name first later. Okay. Yong Yong Cheng Wu. Miss Yong Cheng Wu. Okay, congratulations, congratulations. to all the So we will share, um, we will email you the details and how to redeem the vouchers. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashley. All thank right, you so much for your time you. for sharing the very informative talk for today's session. Okay, Dr. I think we will let you go now. All right. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us until the end of this segment, until the end, of the end of this session. So be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Sunway Medical Velocity for more details and information on our future events, promotions, and etc. Thank you so much for everyone, and we hope that this talk would be beneficial for all of you. Remember to always stay safe and yeah, always uh, follow the SOP. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope you guys have a good remaining weekend. Bye.